Good afternoon. So uh, today we're going to work on needed test questions. Dates September 29th. We're not going to have many questions today. It's not going to take as long as usual. Uh, basically, uh, just I want to make sure we cover a couple items pretty clearly. So let's begin. So the first question uh, involves National Electric Code section Article 250. Uh, the grounding and bonding section of the National Electric Code. We've had a couple of, of quick questions regarding some of these uh, before, uh, but here was a, a quick summary that I thought was was pretty good for the whole situation. So if we look at the, the uh, uh, terms on the left, uh, we need to match those up with the items on the right. So if I look at uh, grounding conductors, what is a grounding conductor? Uh, and I look at all the options over here, that's going to be this guy right here. Uh, that's the conductive path that provides ground fault current path and connects normally non-current carrying metal parts of equipment together and to the system ground conductor or the grounding electrode conductor. What's all that mean? It's like that grounding inductor, grounding inductors, that's the green wire that's going to attach every electrical box, every electrical compartment, uh, any metal casing is going to connect it back to earth ground, back at the source where we came in at. So uh, that's the grounding inductors. The grounding electrode. Now, the grounding electrode uh, is the way that we establish a path to the earth, uh, the actual connection to the earth. And that grounding electrode could be uh, like a ground rod, uh, or it could be a series of ground rods or a ground system around the building, a uh, ground ring, uh, but it's the way that we connect directly to the earth. Grounding electrode conductor. Okay, so what is that? Let's way down here. That's the conductor that's used to connect the system grounded conductor uh, or the equipment to a grounding electrode or to a point on the grounding electrode system. So that's our connection right down to the grounding electrode. Okay. Grounding conductor. This was difficult for me in my younger years. A little better now. It's a system or circuit conductor that is, that is intentionally grounded. Basically, on the systems that we have now that we deal with, that's our neutral. Okay, it is not the grounding conductor, but it is a grounded conductor. So back at the source, we actually connect that to the grounding system. Okay, so it's often referred to, referred to as uh, the, the the neutral conductor. Uh, the main bonding jumper here. That's the connection between the grounded circuit conductor and the equipment grounding conductor at the service entrance. So uh, if we have the pole uh, coming in uh, and the service drop coming into our house, uh, and here's our meter compartment, some utilities want that ground main bonding jumper done at this location, some just inside the house at the little circuit breaker panels. But at one location, either at the meter panel or at your service entrance panel, one of those locations, there will be a jumper from the neutral, the only location that is done for the neutral, from the neutral to the ground system right there going to earth going down to the uh, grounding electrode. Uh, so that's the one point where neutral is tied to ground. And then we have this system bonding jumper, and uh, that's where, I'll read the definition, but the connection between the grounded circuit conductor and the supply side bonding jumper or other equipment grounding conductor or both at a separately derived system. So that is where you're actually connecting back to the service provider like a uh, utility, and we're trying to get back to that location as well. So. Uh, that would be my system bonding jumper, tying it all together. So that's a brief overview. Hopefully that helps uh, to discuss and to understand a little bit more about the NEC, National Electric Code, uh, grounding and bonding. All right, so we've got some questions here. 
this is just general electric safety. Uh, the first question here is says like, what's the full load current and available short circuit current for a 2000 kVA three phase transformer with a two, 208 volt secondary and a 5% impedance, okay? Notice that I didn't even give the high side voltage because it's not needed because I'm dealing with the low side voltage. So basically the equations that we have to have here that we want to deal with is I want to know what the full load is. I full load. So that's going to be a function of the KVA rating of the transformer and the voltage that we're talking about. And so this equation that we deal with is an equation uh, where we've got the, the, the KVA of the transformer. is equal to the square root of three voltage line to line in the current in the line. So this is my basic equation. I'm sorry about the little red line through there. I don't know how that happens. I, I certainly couldn't have caused that problem. But if I solve for the line, the, the current here, I load, uh, basically that I load is going to be KVA over square root of three times the voltage line to line. So if I look at that, I got 2000 kVA, which is 2000. And I'm going to add my three zeros here, divided by the square root of three. And my voltage line to line is 208. So when I do all that math, I find out that the actual full load current is 5,552 amps. That's a beast. 5,552 amps. So that's, uh, that's one of the questions. Uh, one of the answers. But the other question was, is like, uh, and I can answer this one because I've got the full load there. But this transformer is 5% impedance, and it wants to know what the short circuit current is. So basically, to find the short circuit current, you take the full load current divided by the percent impedance. So in this case, it's 55, 52 amps divided by 0 0.05 for 5%. And so when I do that math, I find out that my fault current is 111,104 amps. Wow. That is an enormous fault current. That's more than any of our grounding uh, conductors or our personal grounding uh, sets will handle. So uh, pretty good sized transformer there, 2000 kVA, 208 volts. So that would be the answer. Uh, the answer would be item C here, 5,552 amps, short circuit current, 111,000. Okay, so let's go through some definitions here uh, that involve uh, uh, NFPA 70E, basically. A lot of questions on NFPA 70E. So define the limited approach boundary, okay? So question number one possible thing is, is like an answer number one possibility is an approach limit at a distance from an exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part, which a shock hazard occurs or exists. Eh, that sounds like it could be. Uh, B, the closest a qualified worker can get to an exposed energized conductor if he or was wearing rubber insulated gloves, PPE, using insulated tools, or has energized bars conduct guarded for voltage. Uh, basically, for a qualified worker, that would be called the restricted approach boundary. Uh, item C, uh, the same as making contact. That's obviously not it. Uh, D, the distance from the exposed energized conductors that would result in a second degree burn, that has everything to do with an arc flash boundary. That's the point where you would reach a second degree burn. So the answer here is it's an approach limit uh, distance where you have to start being concerned about the shock hazard analysis. So anytime you discuss restricted approach or limited approach, those are dealing with shock hazards. 
uh, not arc flash. They don't have anything to do with arc flash other than the fact that someone's working in that area or doing an activity in those areas that could create an arc flash. That's the signal for needing arc flash clothing. Item three, kind of already discussed that before it says, but define the arc flash boundary. Okay, so uh, the possible answers. The closest uh, a qualified person can, can be to an exposed energized conductor to circuit parts without wearing rubber gloves. No, that's the restricted approach boundary for a qualified worker. B, the closest uh, an unqualified worker can get to an exposed energized circuit. No, nope, that was the limited approach boundary. Uh, possible answer C, the point at which the arc flash hazard is 1.2 calories per square centimeter or larger. Uh, okay, that is that is the answer. That's the answer that we're going to look at. But let's look at D. The distance from the exposed energized circuits per circuit parts that would result in a third degree burn to the unprotected skin. That is not correct because 1.2 calories per square centimeter is the onset of a second degree burn. So you, you could have looked at item D uh, or answer D if, if it had said second degree. Number four, once placed into service, rubber gloves must be cleaned, inspected, and electrically tested every so many months. Well, that is six months, okay? And that's a tricky question. Uh, no more than 12 months from the date stamp on the cuff. So even if they sit in the bag after they were tested and they've never been issued it, it, after a year, they have to be retested anyway. So uh, six months after the date stamp or six months after the date of issue, but no more than 12 months after the date stamp. So six answers, six months would be the best answer here. Uh, question number five. When circuits or equipment are placed in an electrically safe work condition, they are disconnected, uh, locked out, tagged out, locked and tagged out, lottoed, and what? Okay. Now, verified by a supervisor. Yeah, I don't know about that. Tested to ensure the absence of voltage and grounded if determined necessary. Uh, barricaded so unqualified persons cannot approach. Uh, nothing else. Lock, lot act, lotto is uh, all OSHA requires. Well, that's item B. Okay. Our steps. Identify. Personal identification, knowing where the equipment's fed from. Okay. Uh, isolate and lock out. Then test it. And then ground. And the actual verbiage is ground if determined necessary. We've determined it's necessary at above 480 volts. All right, general safety questions. Good one. Okay, we're going to finish up today talking, and it won't take very long, but I just want to make sure we go through this problem and we have a good understanding about it. Let's talk about the power factor triangle or the power triangle, okay? And so we're going to look at an issue uh, to take a, a view of that issue like a utility or a customer might do uh, to try to improve things. So this is a question on how do we actually correct power factor and we know the answer is is like typically uh, we have inductive loads uh, as a customer and to correct that power factor we need capacitors in there but now we want to actually go a little deeper in that with these two questions. So item number one. The current conditions on a utility feeder, so I'm looking at it from a utility perspective, operating at 13 kV, okay, uh, phase to phase, it has a current of 150 amps on that phase. Uh, the load is inductive, so the current lags by 35 degrees. So we remember Eli the Iceman, you get tired of hearing me say that, Eli the Iceman. So we have Eli, inductive, so the voltage got there by 35 degrees before the current did. Uh, so the inductive, so the current lags by 35 degrees. Draw the power triangle for this system, okay? So one thing I need to understand is when I def determine or talk about power factor, uh, that's the cosine uh, of theta, and that angle, theta, is the angle between the voltage and current, okay? So here I've got voltage at zero, and I've got current, doggone it, 
I've got current lagging by 35 degrees and it's all rotating counterclockwise. Well, I also need to understand that that same theta power factor is part of my power triangle where this is watts, this is vars, volt amperes reactive, and this is my volt amperes. This angle associated in this power triangle is also 35 degrees. That's my power factor angle. So I always draw my triangle uh, with VARs going up. Uh, it's okay this time because just understand that these are inductive VARs. They're caused by motors and windings and transformers and, uh, and, and lighting and those sorts of things. Most of the things that we would have in a facility. So there's my power triangle. There's the relationship between the voltage and current. So basically I want to understand that my power factor is the cosine of 35 degrees. That's the angle. And so I look at that power factor and I do the calculations on my calculator. That is 0.82. So in this particular case, I would say that my power factor is 0.82 lagging. Okay. Again, where I want to be is 1.0, but I'm at 0.82 lagging because the current lags the voltage. So that is actually where I'm at. So if I look at my power triangle, I'm going to redraw here and start working with that. This is 35 degrees. Okay, so, and so the cosine of 35 degrees is 0.82. So I can determine a couple of things here. Volt amperes is going to be what? Volt amperes is the square root of 3 times the voltage line to line times the current in the line. So that's the square root of 3 times 13.2 kV times the current in the line was 150 amps. So when I do the math there, I find out that actually what I've got is I've got a lot going on this line. Now, again, that's a utility. That's 3.43 MVA, megavolt amperes. So I go back and I say the VA right here is 3.43 MVA. So I need to determine my watts. And my VARs. Again, I apologize for the last the slash line there. So a couple of ways I can actually calculate the watts. I need to understand that this cosine of 35 degrees, which was 0.82, uh, is actually uh, watts divided by volt amperes. So I've got everything I need here. So I know that uh, if I want to solve for watts, that is basically uh, VA times 0.82. And when I do that math, that's 0.82 times that 3.43 MVA. So that turns out to be 2.81 megawatts. Now, also, I can figure out watts by the equation, square root of 3, voltage line to line, current in the line, cosine of theta. That will give me the same answer. If I want to know what the VARs are, I have to understand that I have to do a little trig here, or I can use Pythagorean's theorem, but I'm going to use the trig in this case. I'm just going to say that, you know, the VARs, is equal to square root of 3 times the voltage line to line times the current in the line times the sine of theta. So the sine of 35 degrees and that sine of 35 degrees happens to be 0.57. So this turns out to be square root of 3 times 13.2 kV. 
uh, times uh, the current in the line was 150 amps times 0.57 and I find out that my VARs on this system is 1.96 megabars. So there's my power triangle. So that's actually what the system is now. So the question that comes up is now, and the problem, the utility wants to change this power factor and get it uh, more in line to where the current and the voltage is closer and uh, will actually increase their voltage and will reduce how much coal they have to put in their uh, uh, boiler to create the energy to start with. Uh, so the utility wants to correct the power factor to 90%. And so the question is, uh, what kind of capacitance would be needed? So I'm going to go ahead down here and we'll start another page just so we understand, because this is where we are with the existing system, 35 degrees, and I had 2.81 megawatts. I had 1.96 megavars and I had 3.43 megavolt amperes. So they and this power factor was 0.82. All right. So that's the existing system. What do I want? Well, here's what I want. I want 2.81 megawatts because I want the same amount of work to be done. So I want the same watts. I don't know what my VA is yet, and I don't, my volt amperes, I don't know what that is. And I don't know what my VA is yet. All I know is that I want my power factor to be equal to be 0.9, okay? So what does that mean? Well, if I look at 0.9 power factor, uh, I don't know what the angle is. So I have to start using my trigonometric functions, my inverse function uh, of the cosine of 0.9, will actually give me that angle. So if I plug in my calculator 0.9 inverse cosine, I will find out that this angle is 25.84 degrees. And if I had known that it would come out with some strange number like that, I would have probably changed my numbers to start with. <clears throat> so I know that my angle here is 25.84 degrees. So now I have to understand what my VARs are and what my volt amperes. Well, I have to go back to trig. So if I want to know what my VARs are, that's looking from this angle. That's the opposite side of this angle right here. It's the opposite side of this angle, and this is the adjacent side. So this would be opposite over adjacent. That's the tangent function. The tangent of theta is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. So if I look at the tangent of 25.84 degrees is equal to the opposite side, which I don't know what that is, but I know it's VARs, over the adjacent side, which is 2.81 megawatts, I can start to solve this out because the tangent of 25.84 is 0.484. times 2.81 megawatts is going to tell me that my new megavars is 1.36 megavars. So this guy right here is 1.36 megavars. So I can actually do whatever I want to. I can actually figure out the other side of this, but I don't really care about what the volt amperes are right now. This is all the information I know because my existing 
was 1.96 megavars. And my new 0.9 or 90% power factor is going to be 1.36 megavars. And so the difference between those is how much capacitors that I've actually had to put in. So that's 1.96 minus 1.36 is 0.6 megavars of capacitors. So basically 600 kVar of capacitance is needed in order to be able to make that change. So that's uh, that's a good question. A good uh, it's, it's going to be like a level three or a level four kind of question, uh, but a very good question to have. So hopefully it's been good. I will send this out. Uh, you'll have it. I do want you to send me an email when uh, uh, when you've completed uh, watching this video. Thanks and have a great day and a great week.